Recording live from the ARC studios, welcome to the Sustainability Podcast. Our goal is to provide engaging discussions on a broad range of topics regarding cybersecurity, sustainability, supply chain management, plus much more. For more information and to get into contact with us, visit us at arcweb.com. Welcome again to another episode of the Sustainability Podcast. Today, I truly am thrilled to be joined by a longtime colleague and friend, Mitch Kaminsky. Welcome, Mitch. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for, uh, appreciate you having me here. This is great. And just been listening to a number of the podcast episodes you have and just really fascinating and excited to be here. I'd like to give give Mitch a, a little bit of an introduction. Currently, He's the founder and general partner at Futureland Ventures, an organization that invests in transformative early stage startups to build a more sustainable, resilient and connected future. Uh, prior to, to Futureland Ventures, Mitch has had an interesting and varied career. Most recently, he was the director of self-driving vehicles, transportation and smart cities at the Consumer Technology Association. And previous to that, he was at the United States Department of Transportation as the Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives and Technology Policy at NHTSA. So I expect to have an awful lot of insights from Mitch today. Again, Mitch, welcome. Um, let's get let's just get started. You've had a very varied career, uh, particularly as I scroll through your LinkedIn profile. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to to this point in in the industry? Absolutely, Jim. And I think you, you really hit on a you know a, a, an interesting theme that I have had a varied career. I you know began my career as an attorney. I went to the University of Miami Law School, and really the core theme that unites a lot of the things that I've done throughout my career, I've thought about is how can I look at how can you know, thinking about some of the big problems that exist as a society and how can we think about technology as a way to leverage the tools with that. And sometimes not every problem is technological, which we can get into, of course, but, but you know, how can we, you know, uh, but I've been really fascinated in the common thread is how do we look at these big problems and what are ways that I can have an impact, whether it's small, large, or in between. And so I started out as very fortunate after law school, I went up to Washington, D.C. and became a counsel on the House Oversight Committee where I was a national security investigator and led a number of efforts into cybersecurity, which in 2009 was you know, much more um, uh, a, a, a not as discussed as the same kind of dialogues on the front pages of newspapers and, and, and kind of being interspersed, right, in this IoT world where everything's connected. So it was really fascinating being on the cutting edge of that and that really started my career out in the technology world, being involved and looking at emerging technologies and going to to Mexico and looking at the drug cartel organizations and thinking about how they're leveraging technology and systems and how the U.S. is reacting against those. And that's all fascinating stuff. But yeah, I, I think another, after my time in the government, so I was on the House side and then I worked for U.S. Senate leadership leading uh, technology policy, infrastructure, and transportation policy as well. So, you know, been involved in MAP21, the FAST Act, and there's a number of interesting innovations um, in the FAST Act that we can get to as well. Um, but I think kind of getting into the sustainability part, which can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, and that's a bit about my career. I've seen sustainability from a number of angles, that I was a co-founder of Venture Smarter, and that's where we were able to meet and collaborated on IEEE standards and looking at smart city projects, which smart city, right, is its own connotation, but really a combination of, of climate, um, new technology, thinking about how do we solve problems in cities and communities, resilience, and so uh, connectivity. So a lot, there's actually, I find with sustainability, there's a convergence there. So at Venture Smarter, we built a 7,000 plus organization, a B2B slash D, so business to business and government, it was pretty unique. But what we were ultimately trying to do, and you were a part of this, not only part of community, but a leader in that community, Jim, 
Um, but we were trying to develop and accelerate smart city projects. So the things relating to sensors and roads that can be connected to infrastructure, smart street lighting, connectivity and um, uh, rings in, in rural communities and um, things dealing with clean energy. So uh, we eventually, we started out by putting together the startups, corporates, and then trying to create a public-private partnership that was ultimately investable for private equity and other investors that were looking at P3s and infrastructure as a really exciting space for a number of reasons that you're obviously very familiar with. But they were concerned about the ROI on these projects. So we were in between trying to make sure that these new innovative generate um, new um, uh, very exciting next generation infrastructure would be something that could be actually investable. And so after Venture Smarter, I moved on to the Department of Transportation where I um, led a lot of the work on emerging technologies and vehicle safety at NHTSA and advised uh, the secretary on uh, transportation innovation as well. And then following that, I went to the Consumer Technology Association where I led our policy efforts on smart cities, transportation, electrification, uh, biometrics, and a number of things. And that really all evolved to Futureland um, where I lead a um, venture capital syndicate where, as you, you mentioned, we really are very excited about uh, innovative technologies at the cusp of sustainability and climate. And we've num invested in a number of very exciting companies that are uh, doing some um, very innovative work in the space, which we can get a little bit deeper in. So in Futureland, we um, have about 500 LPs and uh, uh, a number in, uh, and we invest in the U.S. in early stage, so pre-seed and seed companies. And um, our average check is about 100K, but we've invested um, a lot more in, uh, than that into individual companies as well. So I can stop there, but, um, you know. That's if, good. We, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I sense you could go quite a bit longer on that subject, yeah. but we'll, we'll we'll get there. Yeah. You know, for, for those of the listeners that, you know, may not be, um, you know, terribly educated about sustainability, Maybe you can walk us through, you know, how, um, you know, how, what, how, how you see the current ecosystem, um, you know, what does it mean to you from your perspective? And, and let me just provide some foundation that, you know, for me, you know, I tend to use the standard definition of sustainability, which has three pillars. One mm -hmm. is preserve or enhance the natural environment. The second is to, is the societal pillar of everything from a safe route to school, to a vital economic community for jobs, to mm -hmm. uh, the third pillar is the economic one. And, you know, the, the finance person in me says, well, if we can't make the first two um, the subject of a strong business case, they're not going to happen. And, and, and ultimately it becomes an academic exercise. So for me, the environment, social, and economic, they all need to work together. And if you ever see that Venn diagram, it's three circles that overlap in the middle. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's that's what I see. Um, what do you see the sustainability technology industry nexus as being today? Absolutely, that's a great question. And, and I, I think it's such a great point to dive into. I think there are many levels, right, of what's sustainability, because there's subcategories of each of those components that you mentioned, right? And you're thinking about how corporations are thinking about this and implementing chief sustainability officers, officers uh, also incorporating and bringing on more uh, DEI uh, types of leadership to their organizations. And then thinking about how to either offset, um, uh, do carbon uh, offsets, right? Or thinking about how to create efficiencies with their own supply chain to make it more sustainable. But the part of the way I think about sustainability is, is you know, along that same approach is that sustainability is kind of its own core concept, but it's really very vertical in that, you know, it can, it touches uh, buildings with properties, right? That's actually one of the biggest areas that's uh, most exciting for the future. And we can get into some of that stuff more. Um, but but in sort of the building space, what type of glass you use, how are buildings using energy and what are the costs of those right of those buildings? Right. You know, to kind of hit at you know, some of the things that you mentioned, you know, the economic costs. I think one of the things 
the of the state I'll talk about the state of the industry if I you know and I'll jump back into you know what does this sustainability mean but you know as an investor uh, 10 15 years ago there was, there was a lot of investment in the same area but there weren't the business models were were not thought about thought out right and they were not viable and to, to say to be honest they weren't sustainable if we're um to use a nice little pun on there uh so the, now when when i meet with founders i'm also an advisor at greentown labs um which is a um a clean energy incubator in uh, houston and boston and actually the uh uh, uh, I was saying I was going to say King William, but I guess Prince William and um, and and uh, his wife Kate Middleton were were there recently looking at some of the innovations. Uh, but so nowadays, what the core thing we see, I think, core difference the state is that these entrepreneurs and innovators are thinking about not only about the inno- uh, technological innovation, but how do they make that vi- viable in the market, and they're thinking about that from the early conception days as well. So it's not just Government funding can be helpful, and it still exists, and there's going to be more of that within the um, Inflation Reduction Act and a substantial amount more. But I think it's a combination that not that's going to jump start, can jumpstart things, depending on your political view of it or not. Um, but but the key is jumpstarting doesn't mean that it's going to continue on the road and uh, go along the way. So, but when I think about sustainability, I kind of to zoom out a little bit. You know, I think about, you know, that 800 million people are currently vulnerable to climate change impacts, droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme weather, sea level rise. And I think very recently we've seen these types of of challenges in California, in New York, most recently with the air quality. Um, So these are not just uh, climate change or sustain, you know, I think in a way climate and sustainability are also very interchangeable. But I think sustainability also goes to not only buildings, right, but to vehicles, and it will go into to minerals and 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 raw materials, right? And then the actual production. One of the companies that we've invested in, Intramotive, it's a um, all an electric autonomous um, a, a freight train. They are really thinking about um, not only you know how how can we we uh, create innovations within the the freight vehicle and supply chain but how to make it more how to make it cost of cost less than its competitors which is traditional rail and trucks so it's not just a kind of going again it's not just about you know having something that's clean energy it's having something that's going to be viable for businesses and so i think there's also another couple very quick things of just how consumers are thinking about this consumers are really more than ever thinking about how do they eat and consume food in a more sustainable way. So the impossible foods and, you know, all these things that 10 years ago, nobody heard of now they're in grocery stores, but then I'll end on the two things. I think that are very interesting and exciting for the industry is about compute on the amount of compute that's used and how of energy and how we're going to be, because compute power is only becoming exponential with the advent of, um, number of things going on, right? And that's hand in hand also with AI, right? That need more compute for AI. But how can AI, um, how can we use AI to think about sustainability to have better metrics for sustainability? Because I think that's one of the issues in the industry too. We can talk about challenges, right? But you know, how do we quantify this? How do we actually understand if there's an impact? How do we understand the actual economic uh, value, right? Those are real. Those are critical questions. If this if sustainability is going to really move forward in the way that people hope and expect. Well, it's great to have a, such a passionate guest. <laughs> that, that, thank you for that. Um, you know, let me ask you, let's back up a little bit. And I know you're, you're focused in your current role in solving, solving issues, but let's, let me ask you to put your hat back on at, as you, you know, in your roles at the DOT at, um, uh, at, uh, as the associate director for NHTSA, as well as the director um, over at the Consumer Technology Association, and those are large, you know, um, organizations that don't move terribly swiftly. But from from their perspective, what were the or what are even currently the largest challenges to to creating a more sustainable world? 
Absolutely. I think I think you're right. And you said it very kindly that those organizations don't move so fast. Um, luckily, at the Department of Transportation, the secretary had uh, uh, definitely encouraged uh, a lot of innovation. Of course, there are the government. There are uh, some forms of red tape. Right. But but I think, you know, to your question, I think one of the big challenges and how these big organizations think about it is that when we're looking at smart cities, which is a, we were talking a little earlier, there's a deconstruction. Smart cities is really you know thinking about resilience, sustainability, and connectivity, right? So well, I think the challenge is that there are lots of pieces of this puzzle. So you think about electric vehicles, right? Just in that sense. So for the federal government, the federal government regulates certain parts of the vehicle, the FMBSS, and um, also looks at uh, electri electrification and trying to think about how they can uh, regulate the safety of it. And the states are having their own activity, right? So in California, uh, Governor Newsom has put together <clears throat> legislation. So there's lots of pieces, and I, you know, that's just kind of one, you know, example. If you go to just just electric vehicles on its own, there you could look at this in many ver verticals. But the challenge is, right, is that you, for just thinking about if you're a consumer i want to purchase an electric vehicle it's simple right you just you know you you there's various options in the market you look at it but the supply chain of that is much more complicated number one for electric vehicles right of where do we uh mine or or get the um rare earth mineral minerals for the battery so that's just kind of starting from first principles right where do you get the raw material there's a lot of debate right now about mm -hmm. you know, a significant portion of that is in in Congo and Africa right now, and a lot of that is um, uh, controlled or um, or um, well, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but uh, but a but a certain country or countries uh, you know have a lot of a dominant position in that in, in where where that raw material exists. So we have to think about as a country, right? You know, and this is how the government is thinking about this too. You know where are other sources of raw minerals for electric vehicles? So you have that first component of where do you even get this? You know, source the materials. Then where do you put the supply chain together? And, you know, thinking about from a safety perspective, a lot of vehicles are put together in China and other parts, but there could be cybersecurity concerns there, right? Or you know, also thinking about how do you make that supply chain sustainable too? If you're making an electric vehicle, you don't want the the supply chain <laughs> Uh, the production of it to outweigh the 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 overall benefit of having the electric vehicle. So it's not just the uh, initial output. And then once the electric vehicle, you know, how the government is thinking about putting rules to this is that they want to make sure it's safe. So there's, but they, you know, a certain in in the U.S. One of the challenges we had with smart cities, but I think technology overall is that when there's administration shift, there's a difference of view. So one of the things I think that these large organizations are thinking about is not how to just um, one, how do they put it, how how do they cultivate production of electric vehicles, and that's there's le le legislative and regulatory, um, but also you know in that you know what technology are they requiring the use of a specific technology? Are they requiring the use of materials from the United States as part of um, the the um, um, the government credits that are being allowed. So that, that's an issue that's being heavily discussed right now. And then also to their silos. So you have the Department of Transportation working on electric vehicles, but you also have Department of Energy involved in this, right? You know, in terms of the a CAFE, which is the co corporate average fuel economy. Um, there's multiple organizations and multiple economists dealing with this. Then there, so I could really go even way more in the weeds here, but I think one of the big, challenges when you think about these big organizations is that they're they're designed to be like a ship turned slow but technology goes much faster so how do you in kind of ensure that things are done in the sustainable way but while making sure that you're enabling the market to thrive so it's kind of a balance between working with lots of so i think one of the big challenges there's silos in between and we're just talking about an example of an electric car here, right? That we can mm -hmm. go to, you know, you know, other verticals that would have similar discussions. Well, well, Mitch, that that brings up um, 
an an interesting question I, I that that I have here, uh, and I don't <clears throat> and, and and I don't mean to put you on the spot as an insider, but yeah. <laughs> you know you know my background comes from doing um, standards development work uh, for the U.S. DOT in intelligent transportation systems, which are those standards and those projects are often the result of a very strict systems engineering process of identifying stakeholders, user needs, which ones have consensus. Um, and creating test plans that overlay that so that you do, in fact, satisfy your need. So I come from that mindset. And as you speak about siloing, particularly in the U.S. Department of Transportation, um, how do you address the fact that I, I see the safety in in a vehicle is is increasing? Indeed, vehicles start looking very similar, have been looking very similar in the last couple of decades because, well, there's rollover standards, there's there's different standards. So, frankly, cars aren't as different as when you or I might have been young, number one. And that is driving safety for the passenger and the driver. However, the other road user, the, the pedestrian, has not been so lucky. Um, how is it that the the stakeholder that rides on his, on his shoes rather than in a car is less served. Yeah, that's really, a, 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 that's a, such a great point and an and excellent question. So I think that there's, when I was at the Department of Transportation, some of the conversations at a high level without, you know, talking about specific people sure. or um, but a lot of these uh, ideas are are out there and published and 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 being discussed in publicly too. But what I could share is that when I was at Department of Transportation, we saw a a really concerning trend where pedestrians, the act the um, incidents involving pedestrians were increasing at a very uh, rapid rate, and um and that that's been a challenge. So the department, um you know department has very specific rules for vehicles right like you said you know the the vehicles have these standards and you can change what the interior may look like or this or that right but a steering you can even change i guess theoretically what the steering wheel looks right but it's still steering wheel and um but with pedestrians there are a couple of issues the department was thinking about number one there are very local rules with pedestrians so uh, it's hard for the federal government to change it. And then on a local level, they're at such a, a swath of of different rules and regulations and different communities and practices, right? So when you're walking in New York, people may just ignore a red light, you know, or the car might ignore a red light, the taxi cab. Uh, but when you're in, a, you know, a different town, right, there may be different, more, not only um, actual rules, but more um, uh, cultural rules rules involved as well. So that makes uh, protecting pedestrians a little bit more of a challenge. The other layer of that is uh, the um, just sort of the technology involved in it, that there's distra distracting and there's it's harder to gain quality data of, you know, if there is an incident involving a vehicle and a pedestrian, trying to figure out who's at fault, you know, for when there's a pedestrian, right? Because how can you measure or and this is something that people are because in cars there's you know beginning proliferation in some areas where there's cameras that can have computer vision and ai to tell whether someone's sleepy or whether they're looking at the road and thinking about distracted driving but for pedestrians that hasn't been the case and it's also been very hard for researchers and nitsa at dot has a right. uh, statistical group that's really like diving in the like like a data analysis, uh, uh, you know, uh, a group that's kind of thinking about these, and it's very hard to quantify that. So, kind of the newest technology is how can you, you are thinking about how can you connect vehicles and phones. So there's Vita X, which is vehicle to everything technology, mm -hmm. and that also is you know thinking about including vehicles to vehicles, vehicles to emergency vehicles, and vehicles to pedestrian, which is more V to P. But these things are still in development so it's it's going to continue to be a challenge um you know as but um there's there you know education is going to be a part of it but you know it's also on an individual level that's not regulated so it's it's it, it it's you know it's definitely a challenge 
Well, you brought up an, an, an interesting point there that I, I had neglected to think about is that the the um, agencies that manage, say, that the crosswalk in, in my town are not is not NHTSA. It's the city, county, state and, and, ha- and has a completely different set of stakeholders. Um, but on an optimistic note, you're right. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work in v, v to X. And there may be a point in the future where if you have your phone on and your V2X is enabled, that the vehicle that's converging on you in the crosswalk may not be permitted to come that close to you. That may well happen at some point. Um, what's what's I think more nearer term and encouraging is I know in an automotive OEM this week, announced that a large language model AI like ChatGPT <clears throat> will be in the vehicle. <laughs> and that may be, in my mind, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. That may be a killer app that stops people from looking at their phone. If they could just talk it out and get a right answer without having to scroll and scroll and scroll. Absolutely. I, w- I saw that announcement and I was looking forward to that feature too. And, and that's why I, mention AI, you know, and that, and from the investment in, I mean, I think everyone's talking about AI and a lot of people are thinking about already exploring how to use it, but that's an amazing use case, right? And you could probably from all the projects that you've done, right? You know, how could AI now in its form and where it's going to go, how could that benefit it? But, but that's a perfect example. And there also is going to be challenges of that coming along too. But I, you know, on a personal anecdote, right? When you're driving your car and I I I'll, I speak to Siri, so I guess I'm giving away my my operating system. <laughs> but um, but you know I speak to Siri, they play this song, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But but a more sophisticated system could create that type of thing, and that that you know, and also there are ways to use that system too to think about things in a more sustainable way within the car. You know, that you know, if you're at a stoplight, to say you know don't you know, stop using energy, you know, while you're, you know, uh, while you're in idle, some cars automatically do that now, but others. Are, so there's a lot of potential with having AI and these information systems in car to, in, to make impacts. In, in, indeed. So, I mean, in, in my challenges bucket, if, if I were to pick three, you know, one of course is the energy transition. There's almost nothing bigger than that. Um, there is the there is the safety issue, and not from a surveillance state perspective, but just having a safer environment using IoT. And then a third one it, that really hits far more the social perspective is that um, lower socioeconomic classes often spend not only a tremendous amount of of their resources on housing, but even more so on transportation to work. And that they're, you know, with with what is happening to transportation and not just the four wheel electric vehicle, but the three wheel, the electric bike, the electric scooter and and, you know, blockchain enabled um, scheduling apps that allow you to transfer from one mode to another. um, The world is going to be a a different place. And in fact, I'll I'll give you an anecdote that for um, last week, for the first time, I took the high speed bright line train from Boca Raton down to Miami. And I was struck by um, a couple of different things. One was that I I didn't see as many um, fleet owned scooters, but I saw a tremendous amount of privately owned electric scooters that were very neatly secured with a chain and a bike lock to wherever their owner left it. So the clutter problem had gone away. But to top it off, I was I was walking past the federal courthouse down there and I saw my first autonomous well, little it looked like an igloo cooler delivering I don't know legal documents or maybe a pizza, um, <laughs> and and <Maybe> both. <laughs> there it was there there it was and I I played a little chicken with it but it's clear that these things are are no longer decades or years in the future but are in fact happening because there's a high speed rail in in South Florida going eventually to Orlando and Tampa the same company is is building an electric version. To go, I believe, from is it L.A. to Las Vegas or or something out west, um, and certainly the second generation of scooters have been embraced, as well as 
autonomous little pizza delivery robots? I, I, one, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I hope I can get one of those autonomous uh, pizza robots near me soon. <laughs> <laughs> But there's also a last mile question there too, right? How does you know how does the you know the robot you know get into if you're in an apartment, right? How does the robot get into the apartment? But but no, that's fascinating. And you're you're a hundred percent right, Jim, and all the stuff that you not only you are observing but you work on, and you you've been a pioneer in the space, and and you know thinking about these questions, and and I think that core part of what you said is right that the a lot of these technologies are here. There's some of it's still early, but we there is substantial progress. And um, these types of technologies are very hard. We've invested in a number of companies in the robotic space, including possible metals and uh, Lemurian labs that are thinking about how to uh, think uh, increase how to use robotics to uh, in, improve sustainable operations and and compute and. And also edge computing. I think that's an area too that we're really interested in. Um, okay. That so, well, well, Mitch, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll interrupt you there and, and set you up with with this. So, we, you know, we've covered a, the landscape of the industry as well as um, a range of different challenges, and certainly there's no there's no lack of those. But what from from you know your perspective as you know leader of an investment firm, which of those are the lowest hanging fruit that really mm-hmm. Um, look like repeatable, scalable business projects. Just go through the laundry list and take as much time as you need. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the first area that you were just hitting on with, and might we call it micro mobility. I think micro mobility is a very exciting place, and it's evolving. It's very new. There are some companies that were built up and that are having to adjust in terms of what the market did. COVID also had a significant impact too. But what, what, what we're seeing in the investment world from is that micro mobility is still an interesting area, but it just depends where you are. So scooters are still in operation and pe- consumers in particular areas do really like them. But electric bicycles actually grew last year more as a percentage than electric vehicles, which I think the average consumer, you know, wouldn't you know really think about, right? But you know, we have invested in a company Commute, which is a micro mobility charging company and IoT hub, and they're making really substantial progress in in working with um, different manufacturers and different locations, and they're building a universal hub, so it's agnostic to a particular mm-hmm. supplier, and it also is agnostic to e scooters, e bikes, but also can fit an electric wheelchair or uh, even these e-robots you're thinking about. But but I think if we've seen anything from the pandemic, right, talking about from an investment, is that people love efficiency and these technologies create more of it. So I think the, the robot, the uh, autonomous robot that you saw on the sidewalk, and even the autonomous vehicles that are in the, um, the roads being tested in Florida, you know, which has been very... Uh, um, ahead of the curve, and a lot of states are actually thinking about this and making strides, especially in Arizona and California too. Um, but but I think we're going to see more of that. And these are testings. I think the hard part about these projects is that when you're you know when you it's just simply software, right? As you know, you can test, you know, have mistakes, and you know you can fix the bugs as, as like I did as a software engineer with you know fix them at three in the morning or whatever it <laughs> whatever it happens, right? Um, but you know there has to be this balance of of safety versus uh, efficiency when you're introducing something to the public in these cities. But I think public transport is an area that's going to be really exciting. And electrification. New York City is already using some electric vehicles, trying to convert some taxis to electric. We're seeing in Lake Nona, Florida, a company, um, uh, the Tavistock Development Company, and we talked about it a little bit. And before we jumped on here and a company like Beep, which is doing an a, autonomous shuttle in a private community and making great strides. Um, you know, CEO Joe Moy is really doing fantastic electric trucking. There's lots of areas where um, where innovators are really doing fascinating things. A company called Vermora, we're not invested in, but we're, we think they're doing really exciting work there, um, doing carbon capture 
uh, that you can uh, retrofit uh, um, a you know, retrofit um, uh, your product onto a vehicle, and so you don't have to create a whole new vehicle and you know capturing. So I think you know kind of listing ideas are just said and. You know, I'm, uh, feel, and by the way, feel free to jump in anywhere here. But mm -hmm. I think carbon capture is an energy storage. Well, I'll kind of step, do one at a time here. But carbon capture, I think, is really one of the areas I'm seeing. There's there's a very high technical barrier, but you're getting really, really smart people to tackle this problem. And investors are are deploying capital to see these solutions because there there's there whether there's a few winners or it's a how however big the space is if they, there can be success there that could radically change not just the you know of course the, the you know the end goal of of you know the our, our carbon dioxide emissions and all that stuff mm -hmm. but the way that companies are are producing energy and and thinking about raw materials it's really transformative and in the VC space, um, overall, the last few years have seen really a huge influx of capital, and um, in, in this environment, just you know, billions of billions of dollars and more investors. Um, we've been looking at climate for a while, but um, climate technology um, remains robust right now. Um, it's slowed about 21% since the beginning of 2022. 2022. But that's actually not nearly the sort of drop off, you know, of compared to the overall VC sector, uh, which is 41 percent in the same period. So you still see there's a lot of interest there. Um, so so carbon capture is an area we're very excited about. Energy storage. We talked about that could you know be applied to buildings, grids. How are we going to build this infrastructure of electric vehicles and how is that going to impact our electric grids right these are a lot of great companies are thinking about uh, these challenges right schneider electric is one of the incredible company that's you know thinking about you know how do they you know help manufacture and put together buildings right you know that are you know could be carbon neutral or i haven't talked to them about their specific goals right but but you know there's a lot of innovative companies in this space the challenge right as you know is you know the transition to this which is some of these industries are antiquated so it's some some areas are a little slower than than expected but again turning around a large ship right that takes some time and a lot of energy and inertia but so i think uh, carbon capture energy storage those are also areas that go really deep hand in hand in transportation and, and you know i think there, there's really you could go down like an endless list of what are these challenges right so i won't i won't do that jim but like you know just a couple things right pollutions of our oceans um on food production harms um development of modern cities right and having them um have ha having them you know what type of technology that you know we're going to be using there and water scarcity um air pollution so there's lots of areas that we're looking at and there's really important social problems there but going back to your point of thinking about sustainability, there's there's three pillars there, and they have to a lot of these solutions have to really comport with all three to be viable and have the potential to be scalable, right? In these markets, so street lighting is a really kind of a low hanging fruit, I think. Um, talk to you know just kind of you know my apologies for not you know just going you know going right after the low hanging fruit, but but I think that that's an area too that. It, that's just a common switching to sustainable lighting saves costs for companies. So, so help me, so Mitch, so help help me understand as let's let's uh, uh, dive a little bit deeper into Futureland Ventures. Mm -hmm. um, are there a number of main buckets of technologies or applications that you focus upon? Absolutely. So we we focus. We'll start a very high level and dive down a little bit. So we're looking for early stage companies that are investing, doing transformative exponential solutions, because that's really when our thesis, that's what's going to change behavior. That's a big a core thing of how we look at that. And then sector, we think about sustainability, which is what we're talking a lot about today, talking about resilience, which is, and connectivity. And 
Oh, by the way, I think all those three things you go together in, a, in some fashion, right? You can call that those are some components of a smart city. But I think sustainability, the fascinating thing about the industry, at least from my perspective, is that sustainability, I don't always view it as a standalone item. You know, I think about not only can something be sustainable, can it be resilient, right? Because if you're thinking about um, solving for hurricanes, wildfires, floods, and natural disasters, it, of course, we want a sustainable solution, but we want something that's also going to be able to, to hold over time, right? You know, from, from, from a different perspective. And then a lot of these solutions are incorporating the technology. So you're thinking about technology. And th in the terms of specific areas we're looking at, technologies, we're very focused on AI, robotics, and then we also look at enterprise software as well. That's an area that we've invested in and where sustainability um, entrepreneurs are doing interesting work too. Um, that's from a technological perspective. From an industry, we've invested in prop tech. We've looked at, we're investing in IoT, um, uh, transportation, we'll call it climate, you know, generally as a bucket. Um, we looked at blockchain. We haven't made an investment there yet because we are, um, others have different views on this, but we we do, you know, with the former government background, right, we do want to see that there's some rules of the road um, to guide it or the ability to shape it with AI, which you know, I think is going to happen. Um, so those are the main kind of areas that we look at. We, we we're, are generally, though, if someone is in those one of those three buckets, sustainability, uh, resilience or connectivity, well, one or more, and you're and it's not in healthcare, we'll we'll look at what they're doing. But we really like big solutions, you know, and 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 hardware. What I think misconception to you know, uh, investors, a lot of investors know the software has great margins. So that's why people um, that's a great model, right? No argument there. But if you look at some of the top five to 10 iconic companies or the largest valuation cap market caps um, currently, uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but I can think offhand, Apple, NVIDIA, um, you know, and, and I remember seeing um, uh, you know fuller list, but in the top five companies of trillion dollar company, Tesla, I, I, let's just call those are three of the top five companies from value perspective. Those are all hardware companies right. that have software components. So as an investor, that's kind of, a, that's, we really kind of look at that because we're, we're here to find com exceptional companies that are going to build something enduring and iconic, but we do have a view that we want it to be um, uh, overall beneficial to the, the planet, right? Or something we can reason <clears throat> Okay, so so Midge, this um, our conversation has been been a bit uh, philosophical so far. Um, you know, I, I know you you've invested in a range of different companies. Uh, can I ask you to perhaps highlight two or three that do have those transformative solutions? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with uh, all of our companies are 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 really focused on this. So um, so. Uh, one of, so every one of our companies is really doing fantastic. For this particular topic, I think there's a couple of uh, interesting areas. We talked about, you know, sustainability and a little bit about, the, you know, wildfires, natural disasters. Uh, so one of the companies that Futureland and Ventures invested in is is called Delos, uh, which is out of um, San Francisco and led by a couple of really just really smart people, um, you know, a rocket scientist and a data engineer from senior data engineer from one of those big uh, engineering companies previously. Um, but what Delos does is they're trying to solve this problem. They have kind of fused predictive analytics, AI, and all you know the you know the the tech stuff. Um, they they are they saw this problem in California of that wildfires. There's obviously wildfires there, but what they were digging into is that insurers were having a problem of thinking about how to how do they provide insurance in these areas do they know where these areas are where there's going to be wildfires how much do they charge so delos has got its start by building a solution of being able to predict um where wildfires by a, a pixel on the map and, and much larger where these wildfires are going to occur and when and 
and all that that type of data and the amount of data that they have in this model is just absolutely mind blowing. But so you have this these genius uh, data prediction folks, and what they decided to do is that there's this empty there um, space in the market of that people need fire insurance um, or wildfire insurance rather um, to protect their home to protect the not only the the just in case anything happens right but also to make sure that the property value of their home goes up and then also to know you know could be helpful too for to where 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 um where the level of risk is so delos is if you compare their model to the, the largest players in the space well number one for a number of years the the they ran their model against actual wildfires and they had a night over about a 95 percent accuracy rate which is unheard of and the other component of it is that since they're able to um to accurately you know all, almost you know with that type of level of accurate accuracy predict these things they can really understand where where the models the other large players were using were getting the uh, their model incorrect about where the highest levels are so these other large players were creating very high premiums or not insuring certain areas where there actually was not particular risks and also vice versa. So I think that's a really interesting to that we're going to see more of as we see wildfires is that how do insurance companies um, do uh, the, there has to be insurance, right? And there, there'll probably be some element of, you know, the government involved here too. So that's, so, so I think that's one really interesting. Well, that one, that, that one is yeah. fascinating. And, and as a resident of Florida, uh, I would mm -hmm. hope that they can come and do something about windstorm insurance. They are definitely thinking about what they're focused on wildfires now, but I, I, that's great market intelligence, Jim. And I know they're definitely thinking about other catastrophes too, because it's the same type of modeling, but you know, different information. So they're, they're certainly thinking about that. So hopefully we can get that product to you. You know, at great. Some point. Sure. great. Go ahead. You have have any others? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole number. I think I mentioned Intramotive earlier. So I, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I think I t briefly mentioned that Impossible Metals is one of those com companies that's doing really fascinating things. But what they're looking at is going back to the electric vehicles, but just a uh, rare earth minerals. Uh, is that because there is this geopolitical conflict um, that that um, we're going to need um, a lot of other research and combine that with there's going to be a lot more electric cars just in the market overall. So people could debate the amount of that, but but the trajectory is obviously increasing. So uh, Impossible mine, my Metals, excuse me, they have built this um, a robot uh, that will go to the bottom of the sea. Um, and they're operating in um, uh, the West, the Asia, uh, West Indies area, and um, and have some per permits through partnerships there. And so what they're doing is because mining uh, will likely also either shift or be additive to include um, the ocean, um, but there's going to be environmental concerns around that, and there there certainly should be. So what the innovative thing they're doing, not only just building this robotic and AI system. Is that they are building this in a way that will be um, that will be able to uh, take take these rare earth minerals, or excuse me, or, or, or harvest them rather, and do it in environment environmentally sustaining way, so they're not damaging the ocean floor, uh, especially that that um, that that depths of the ocean. And they've done a number of tests and successfully, um, so which is really exciting. So that's another area too, you know, kind of you know thinking about you know, companies that are really thinking about, you know, how can we do something pretty, very different, very hard, but if they're successful, they could be transformative. <clears throat> That's great. You know, Mitch, we, uh, this has been uh, really a thought provoking um, session today. Thank you for sharing so much. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time together. Do you have any uh, last minute comments that, uh, well, or more material you, you haven't covered in our 45 minutes together? <laughs> I think I think I've covered mm -hmm. most of it. But, you know, I think there's a couple of, you know, for your audience, I, I would say this is a really exciting area that touches so many, has so many touch points mm -hmm. so that if you do have an interest, there are many ways to get involved. And one way 
one really great community that exists out there is called Work on Climate. And uh, so if you just go to Google or whatever search engine you use, you'd be, be able to find it. And there's lots of like-minded folks who are thinking about these issues, actively working on them, and um, um, thinking about a community. But, you know, this is really an, a not only important problem, but I think, Jim, you can attest to this. This is a really big opportunity um, to, to help improve things, but also, you know, uh, from a market perspective. So we're, we meet, we really meet so many awesome entrepreneurs that are just thinking about, you know, the beauty of, entre- of being a founder is that you're, you kind of have to think that there's no constraints on you, right? You know, or maybe that's maybe not everyone thinks that way. But um, so we're seeing a lot of people that are really trying to uh, take on very tough problems and come up with innovative ideas. So I'm happy to connect with any folks of your audience that are looking to learn more about uh, some of the companies and solutions or what we're just in the market. Um, but uh, really excited just about these very meta problems, right? And why they're somewhat philosophical, but diving into the weeds of, you know, okay, how does this get done? That's that, that's great. So, so Mitch, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to explicitly share your contact information. Can you tell us how um, some of our listeners can, can reach out to you? Absolutely. I'd welcome that and um, appreciate all the, you know, it's, I, I hope this has been, a, you know, a, productive discussion for your uh, subscribers here and community. Um, I can be reached at Mitchell, I'll spell that, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, at Futureland, uh, Futureland, but all one word, uh, dot com. So I'll say the Mitchell at FuturelandVentures.com. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, once again today, our guest has been Mitch Kaminsky the founder and general partner at Futureland Ventures. And they they do a remarkable job investing in transformative early stage companies in the sustainability, IoT, and large data science space. Uh, thank you again, Mitch. And hopefully we'll see you again as a guest on the Sustainability Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jim. It's been a pleasure.